Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part eight of my series on the selected gross pathology of dog. And we're going to talk about the nervous system. A lot of people are intimidated by what I call the vast pink wasteland. So let's keep it light and look at some really great images. Before I do that, as I do it with all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who provided me their fantastic images over the years. And here's a list of my colleagues who have helped me with this one particular lecture on the selected gross pathology of the dog. So let's jump in, and that is a very yellow brain. This is a condition known as kernicterus. It is seen in animals with high levels of unconjugated or unbound bilirubin. Bilirubin is a, a breakdown product of red blood cells and is lipophilic, which means that it can cross the blood-brain barrier when levels get high enough. Now in humans, neonatal jaundice is a very common condition and in severe cases may result in kernicterus and neurologic damage. It's likely that neurologic damage uh, also happens to animals with kernicterus, but it's a little more difficult to measure, especially in cases like this. This is the brain from a foal with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. In these cases, the mare becomes sensitized to antigens on the stallion's red blood cells and produces antibodies which are passed to the foal through the colostrum. So shortly after birth, while the animal is nursing, it starts to take in these antibodies, breaks down its own red blood cells, and becomes very icteric. The pattern of accumulation has been identified in a number of species. This is from an article in Veterinary Pathology on the dog. And the, uh, the basal ganglia and the thalamic nuclei, as pictured here, are some of the early targets, as well as the hippocampus and the cerebellum, before it becomes a diffuse process. Here's an abnormal developmental condition that may be seen in some breeds of small dogs like Lhasa Apsus and Shih Tzus and uh, Maltese. And notice that the normal convolutions, the gyri and sulci of the brain are missing here. There's a couple of terms. When the brain is smooth like this, um, it's called lysencephaly. Higher mammals tend uh, to have a lot of convolution. Lower mammals, including rodents and birds, and, and uh, as we go farther down the phylogenetic tree, tend to have smoother brains. But for a dog, there should be a normal uh, number of, of gyri and sulci. When they're missing, it's called lysencephaly. Another term that may be used in this particular case would be pachygyria, where there are only a few uh, gyri, and they ten tend to be broad or flat. And I think that you could call this either lysencephaly or pachygyria without any problem. Now, this is a sign of a defective neuronal migration from the ventricular zone, which is where all the developing neurons are from around the ventricles during development. It's usually the result of a mutation in a number of genes that control the expression of what I call the chaperone proteins. These are the ones that attach to those neurons and make sure they get to where they are supposed to be in the normal animal. And these proteins have interesting names like double cortin or relin or filamin or lis1. I like lis1. I can always remember that because it goes along with lysencephaly. The cortex is usually thicker on cut section and the normal laminar arrangement is disrupted. And if you're really good at your neuroanatomy, and I'm going to confess I'm not all that great at it, and I always have to look up when I'm looking at sections of brain, I always go online and look on online at atlases to make sure I know where I am. Um, the normal arrangement of everything is really disrupted. Now, the other end of the spectrum are brains that have too many gyri and sulci. And this is called polymicrogyria. Um, this particular condition has been described in standard poodles. And notice 
how all of the very small gyri and sulci are back in the back of the brain in the visual cortex. This particular finding has been associated with cortical blindness. Cortical blindness is a term that describes blindness which arises in the visual processing center of the brain. The eyes and the optic nerves are generally normal. This is a great picture by Dr. Anais de Suter while she was at the University of Pennsylvania and wrote the paper on this very interesting condition. Well, here's a chihuahua with a big head. It probably fell over frontwards a lot of times while it was walking along. Um, notice how sort of uh, poorly developed it is. You know, probably not a good feeder. And the reason that uh, we see this in chihuahuas and other, a number of other brachycephalic breeds is due to the fact that it has developed hydrocephalus. This is a genetic finding in brachycephalic breeds, but there are many different causes of hydrocephalus. This section is obviously taken near the back of the brain because we can see the cerebellum. The lateral ventricles are massively dilated with only a thin rim of cortex. You can also see dilation of the fourth ventricle as well. Another major cause of hydrocephalus, especially in young animals, is viral infection in utero. We've talked about how the developmental uh, neurons uh, and the germinal cells actually of the brain line the ventricles. If there is viral infection of those, such as maybe see with canine parvovirus, then they will be destroyed and a lot of the resulting brain will form in a very uh, dysregulated manner. Uh, you can also see hydrocephalus arise as a result of viral infections uh, somewhat later on in life following development of the brain. Canine parainfluenza will often cause marked inflammation at some of the thinnest places in the brain. Um, the basic lesion here is uh, uh, infection of the ependema and stenosis at the mesencephalic aqueduct, which is basically the narrowest part of the outflow tract. And if you block that, then of course all the CFF, CSF is going to back up into the remainder of the brain. Other infections may infect already developed cortex, and you get a condition known as hydrocephalus ex vacuo, in which the ventricles will always expand um, if there is loss of the overlying cortex. That's called uh, uh, hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Other smaller, uh, not as common conditions would be uh, uh, malformations of the cerebellum and the structures in the back of the brain, including Arnold Chiari defect and the Dandy Walker malformation. And uh, don't forget uh, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, which has a combination of occipital bone dysplasia, um, obstruction of the foramen magnum, and secondary syringomyelia. Of course, most of that particular condition, and most of the other ones that I uh, have mentioned, would never get to, uh, to this level. It's just amazing that an animal like this can function. Uh, one final cause of hydrocephalus to consider is, and it's, it's obviously best uh, uh, identified in non-human primates and people, but birth hypoxia can also cause uh, necrosis of the cortex and compensatory hydrocephalus. Now in the adult animal, when you have damage to the brain, um, you will see cavitary depressions within the, and depressions here uh, from the outline of the brain. But what I want you to note is that these areas have a very yellow color to them. This is common when you have uh, any type of severe insult to the brain because myelin is about 90% fat. And your brain 
Hence is about 90% fat. So if someone calls you a fathead, don't, don't take offense because it's true for all of us. But when you break down fat and when it's oxidized uh, during the cleanup process by gitter cells, um, it characteristically has a very yellowish appearance, which helps you identify areas of cerebral injury. There are changes that you can notice in the brain of old dogs. The sulci or the depressions here tend to be a little deeper and you may see a little bit of white uh, along this which is meningeal fibrosis. These are very common finding in older dogs and, and I think that all brains over time in geriatric animals and geriatric people tend to uh, uh, lose area and tend to uh, become mildly atrophic over time. That's an expectation when you're dealing with a geriatric animal. Doesn't normally imply that there has been some sort of trauma or pathologic process there. Here's a great lesion that we don't see much of anymore. And I want you to look at these three sections. We're gonna start from the back and these are the caudal colliculi of the cerebrum and you can see their multifocal areas in this fixed specimen of hemorrhage and necrosis. Their hemorrhage and necrosis here in the periventricular nuclei and it extends up here into some of the, the thalamic nuclei and this is a very characteristic pattern of necrosis in carnivores that are on a low thiamine diet um, or a diet that contains normal levels of thiamine but perhaps high fish uh, content which contains thiamine splitting enzymes um, a lot of the reason that you get a low thiamine diet is because these diets are old or they have been heated and back in the day especially in um, in people who were producing carnivores like mink for furs uh, fish diets were uh, were cheap and they were readily eaten by the mink but they would they would cause this particular pattern of necrosis within the auditory nerves okay these auditory nerves begin in the uh, in the call colliculi and uh, and project here to these the to the medial geniculate nuclei excuse me up here Thiamine is an important uh, cofactor for a number of enzymes that are involved in carbohydrate metabolism. Um, in areas uh, where the necrosis is gone, you can see a deficiency of transketolase, which is one of the uh, uh, next enzymes that is never uh, produced uh, in animals with thiamine deficiency. And you can also see elevated levels of blood pyruvate. Um, because this particular enzyme cannot be dehydrogenated in the Krebs cycle. Thiamine deficiency looks very different in ruminants where it causes a uh, laminar necrosis of the superficial cortex of the brain. So it's very different between carnivores and herbivores. And something else that you may see in thiamine deficiency in carnivores is myocardial degeneration, especially of the right ventricle. So thiamine deficiency, a very characteristic pattern of necrosis in carnivores. It was originally called Chastec's paralysis because Chastec ran a mink farm in the 1940s. It was first identified in mink and subsequently in foxes on his farm. So that was uh, Mr. Chastec. Oh, here's an interesting lesion, and uh, this petechial hemorrhage of the cortex is uh, on cut section is most often seen at the junction of the grain white matter, and this is a sign that may be seen in this organ and a number of other organs as a result of infection by neorakezia rakezii, the cause of agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It's a tick-borne disease uh, transmitted by dermocenter ticks, and dogs are probably 
a reservoir in this particular case. Um, here's something you might not have known about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but it only causes disease in two species, in dogs and people. And the histologic lesion in both uh, species is a necrotizing, possibly lymphoplasmacytic vasculitis in multiple organs. The uh, organism infects endothelial cells and necrosis of the endothelial cells results in platelet activation and thrombosis. So you get little infarcts around all of these vessels. Uh, the distribution is more often seen in younger animals um, and purebred animals, especially German Shepherds, seem to be predisposed. Along with this, you often will see edema of the ears and the muzzle and the scrotum uh, with petechiation of many organs. And it can also cause infarcts in the retina or any other, uh, any other organ due to vascular necrosis. Uh, animals that don't die of it may subsequently develop glomerulonephritis due to the uh, high antigenemia. Um, that's seen in these particular animals. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, only in the dog. So if you didn't catch it in this lecture, you're probably never going to hear me talk about it again. Oh, bleeding in the brain. Well, this is a traumatic lesion. Um, usually in dogs, it's due to hit by cars. And in cats, it's due to falls. Interestingly, um, cats have a very specific uh, a range of when they can walk away from a fall. It's been documented in urban areas and known as the high-rise syndrome. And it appears that the best level for a cat to fall from out of a skyscraper is five to nine floors uh, because cats have a writing ability. And if it's, a, uh, if it's less than that, although the drop is not as bad between one and four uh, falls, they don't have the opportunity to, to prepare and get ready, and they often will smash their heads or they'll smash their chests on the ground. And then above nine floors, their velocity tends to, uh, even if they do land on all fours, so to speak, um, the velocity tends to uh, cause a lot of breakage and crushing injuries on the, uh, on the chest and head. Um, interestingly, um, when the hemorrhage is on the side or the trauma, is the force is coming from one side. You tend to see more severe hemorrhage on the other side, the so-called contra-coup area, due to the tearing of the vessels where the brain pulls away from the skull on rebound. So there is compression of the brain here. It bounces over here, and as it bounces back, the vessels away from the force tend to tear, and you will see um, more hemorrhage on the side away from the force. So obviously, if there's going to be a skull fracture, it's probably going to be on this area. The architecture here tends to be retained a little better, um, but there will be hemorrhage. Okay, so you can tell a little bit about hemorrhage due to uh, where it's found. If there is epidermal hemorrhage or outside of the uh, uh, of the dura mater, then that's usually due to tearing of a meningeal artery. And subdural hemorrhages are often due to laceration of bridging veins. Okay, those are ones that get stretched and get torn, and those are probably more common. Hemorrhage in the subarachnoid area appears to be more common overall. you may have lacerations uh, in the brain parenchyma itself as a result of uh, a compression over a bony prominence within the inside of the cranium. And the, the cranial bones do have some, uh, some wings on the lateral sides that can act as, uh, um, as uh, penetrating injuries or can cause penetrating injuries if the brain is pushed up hard over them. Just an interesting, uh, uh, interesting picture of my Dr. Paul Stromberg um, showing how blood tends to pool uh, at the bottom of the brain in um, subacute cases. This animal uh, had 24 hours earlier had had a uh, CSF puncture. And of course, that's done 
uh, on top of the brain, behind the brain, right here. But because there was hemorrhage at necropsy, the, all of the blood had accumulated on the bottom. So uh, if you see blood primarily on the bottom of the brain, think about um, laceration of a large artery and vein and prolonged bleeding rather than a quick, massive bleed. Give you a minute to look at this one. Okay, so if you took a look, and, and people often say, here's a little bit of fibrosis up here, you know, there's a little meningeal fibrosis, um, a little bit right here. Remember, we talked about that before, how the cell side tend to get a little bigger in, in older dogs. But what I wanted you to see, and, and, and probably a lot of you didn't pick up on this initially, is there's one optic nerve here. Okay, only one on one side. There's one of these, I think that might be the oculum. I don't know if that's the oculomotor nerve, but, but the key is that there is one optic nerve. And this was in a, I think that is oculomotor. But uh, um, there is unilateral atrophy of those nerves because this animal had been enucleated. Remember that uh, um, especially nerves have to have some some stimulation or they atrophy very quickly so an animal that only has one eye and has been that way for a long period of time you will see atrophy of the nerves on the opposite side of the brain here's a great picture of a lesion that we see very commonly in older dogs and this is the spinal cord. This is probably the lumbar intumescence right here. And what we see, the dura has been opened and folded back. And we see these areas of bone. It's bone and it's red because there is mineral. There's little flakes of, uh, of simple mineralization. But this is actual bone formation. And this is a condition that goes by many names. Um, I like the term ossifying pachymeningitis. It tells you that the there is bone in the uh, in the meninges, and this is this particular lesion is usually seen over the cervical or the lumbar enlargements, and the bone formation only occurs over vertebral bodies. That's why they're spaced out. It doesn't occur over the intervertebral space. And in most animals, it doesn't cause any problem. Um, you can see pain in some animals, uh, especially if it's well-developed like this one, and it presses on the spinal roots. Look at this long plaque by the lumbar intumescence, especially where the spinal roots come out. So something like this rarely can be a cause of uh, uh, paraparesis and pain in older animals. But because so many of the older animals also have concurrent ventral spondylosis, and in certain breeds, degenerative myelopathy, it's often difficult to sort out what is the actual contribution of something like this. Um, and it's usually, most of the time, you'll see it in lumbar areas. If you don't see it there, you might see it in cervical. I don't know if I've ever seen it in the, uh, uh, the thoracic area. I suppose it could happen. Um, you don't see a lot going on um, in terms of discs and, and the spinal cord and thoracic area. Remember, discs rarely rupture in the thoracic area because of the uh, intercostal ligaments, which give them extra protection. So this is a great lumbar lesion that you will see in older dogs. Here's a, a, uh, a, often an incidental finding that I rarely, rarely see. Um, and this is a cyst which is arising um, from the subarachnoid space. And in this particular uh, area, it's also referred to as a quadrigeminal cyst. It's a congenital abnormality uh, of the arachnoid membrane in the area across the top of the fourth ventricle. These cysts may result from uh, uh, in inappropriate trabeculation of the arachnoid, which helps to uh, uh, 
cut down on the amount of cerebrospinal fluid by tracking it back ultimately into the venous system. In some cases, they can cause spinal cord compression um, in the area of the cervical vertebra and the back of the brain. It looks like there has been some compression of the cerebellum with this particular case. And as we finish the non-neoplastic lesions of the uh, nervous system, here's a rare case, um, but it's an interesting lesion. And this is known as cerebral meningioangiomatosis. It has been documented in a number of dogs, often younger dogs, and it can be seen uh, at any level of the uh, nervous system. Um, and it forms these sort of dense plaques uh, within the leptomeninges, which are composed of proliferating um, meningothelial cells, which sort of track along vessels. And the vessels tend to uh, proliferate as well. Um, it appears grossly as a plaque, um, but it may grow downwards into the brain along the perivascular spaces, forming a, uh, a mass lesion within the brain, compressing the underlying parenchyma. Uh, the development of this particular condition is known. There are people who just think it's a hamartoma, and some people think because many of them are, are diagnosed a little bit later in life, um, when they start to cause neurologic signs, that is sort of a progressive malformation. Meningioangiomatosis. Well, now let's talk about the neoplasms of the brain. We'll stay with the uh, meninges. And about 80% of the tumors which you see within the cranial vault, that includes the brain, um, arise from the meninges, meningiomas are fairly common in, uh, in the dog. And they're reported to arise from the uh, surface of the arachnoid layer where they oppose the dura mater. And they usually project into the subdural space and they start to grow and they will fill up all the available space within the subdural space, but they continue to grow. And then eventually they, have, they start pushing up against the cranium because Cranium is a pretty tight-fitting box, and there's only a limited amount of, of space in there. And when they start, um, when they hit that bony ceiling, they grow downward and cause compression atrophy of the underlying uh, cerebral parenchyma or the parenchyma of the areas that can arise on uh, many different areas. This is a pretty common area right here. Very few meningiomas are invasive. Mostly they act as a space occupying mass which pushes down on the brain. It can cause you know significant compression atrophy as well as edema and if you look here um, we can see a couple of signs of uh, uh, that the, this particular brain was edematous. You can see the prolapse of the cerebrum here back here under the tentorium cerebelli, which follows the caudal aspect of the brain. And you can also see some compression of the cerebellum and probably a bit of coning uh, in this particular brain. So meningiomas, they come in many different flavors um, and people like to subclassify them. Um, but the prognosis between most of those classifications, um, at least, in the dog is you know questionable once again look at this little fibrosis of the uh, uh, of the sulci here so i'm thinking that this animal might have had a little bit of age on him now brain tumors we are undergoing a uh, a reorganization of brain tumors right now in the dog. I would refer you to uh, this past year the one of the Wednesday Slide Conference 2018-2019 conferences 6 and 7 where we talked about uh, gliomas and whereas we used to have many different types of gliomas um, including some very odd ones 
like glioglioma's and gliomatosis cerebri and some really sort of bizarre ones. Um, human medicine has basically taken all these odd classifications and and uh, combined them into astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas, low and high grade on each. And the uh, some very prominent veterinary pathologists, including uh, uh, Jay Kohler from Auburn University and Drew Miller from Cornell, among many others, um, in concert with some human neuropathologists, are reclassifying most of these um, previous diversely diagnosed brain tumors and coming up with a very similar uh, classification. So we are condensing the classifications which hopefully will give us a lot better prognostic information. Um, so oligos and astros, they certainly are surviving. A lot of the sort of weird ones um, are no longer there, which is good for my presentation because I don't delve into the rare and uncommon uh, gliomas. Um, let's just talk about oligos. As a general rule, oligos um, because they are derived from the cells that uh, make myelin. Um, they tend to be sort of myelin-like, sort of uh, gel-like on their gross aspect. This is one is being nice because it is arising apparently within the white matter as well. They often will have some hemorrhage to them, but they are slower growing than many of your astrocytomas. So you can tell that this is a expansile neoplasm. It's growing slowly. If it grew really fast, you would have a hard time identifying the borders. Um, so this is a really nice, uh, gross presentation of an oligo. Note that uh, um, there's a lot of edema in this particular section. Uh, the midline is probably pushed to the left a bit, which is not uncommon. I think this might have been a bit of a tangential section, though, because it looks like we have some of the piriform lobe and not over here. Nice picture of an oligo. Um, brachycephalic dogs are predisposed, but brachycephalic dogs are predisposed to most brain things, including brain tumors. They don't tend to metastasize via the CSF, but there have been a number of publications um, recently about uh, uh, a condition known as oligodendrogliomatosis, where you have uh, um, sort of diffuse tumor which appears in the subdural space. If it invades the parenchyma of the spinal cord or the brain, it's really a tumor. But this oligodendrogliomatosis has been identified in uh, cats and I believe uh, one dog um, to this point. But oligos, well demarcated. And, uh, but if there's a little hemorrhage, don't let that uh, throw you off. Astrocytomas uh, tend to be a little more uh, infiltrative. Now, many of the, the brain tumors you're going to see, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's an oligo or whether it's astro. One of the nice things is that uh, uh, there are some uh, areas where certain brain tumors like to be, and one of the spots that astrocytomas like is the piriform lobe. I wouldn't go diagnosing it based just on that, but the location in the piriform lobe is a good one. Astrocytomas are, uh, they're graded out in human uh, medicine, uh, eight, one through four, basically, um, the four being the glioblastoma multiforme, the more uh, aggressive form. I think we are, as we said before, we are going to a simple low-grade versus high-grade. Um, and I would refer you to the 2016 paper by Kohler et al., um, where the criteria for diagnosing this as well as the most appropriate uh, glial markers, immunomarkers, are outlined. There's great information in that paper. And I didn't know that Olig-1, which sounds like it's a great marker for oligodendrocytes, stains astrocytes as well. And so they go through all of that. They also go through um, 
what affects the different markers, including uh, time from autopsy to uh, or death to autopsy. All these sort of affect these immunomarkers that we count on so highly to diagnose these particular tumors. And here's a cross section of this particular one, and you can see that unlike that oligo, this particular tumor doesn't really have good borders. It's growing quickly, so you don't get that. And when you add that to the amount of edema here, um, it's very difficult. And you can tell how the neurosurgeons might go in there and um, they really can't tell where the borders of this neoplasm are, which makes their job even more difficult. There are a couple of neoplasms which are often seen around the ventricles, the tumors of the ependyma, which line the ventricles, and the tumors of the choroid plexus, which choroid plexus normally is within the ventricles. Um, this particular case is a rapidly growing and aggressive ependymoma. These usually show up in the lateral or third ventricle, and unfortunately, we don't have good markers for this particular tumor. They're often uh, very invasive, um, they tend to have very small cells, very small nuclei, and, and often resemble uh, uh, primitive neuroectodermal tumors. Um, and then the extra added uh, difficulty in diagnosing these grossly, astrocytomas can grow in this form, and even some oligos. So, you know, in some of these cases, it is always better to reserve judgment on a gross uh, impression and wait until you have slides that you can look at. So ependymomas around the ventricle tend to be fairly aggressive. And then within the ventricle, um, neoplasms that are arising from the choroid plexus have a particular granularity, as you see here. Um, choroid plexus tumors are, are most well described in the dog. They often turn up in the fourth ventricle. Um, obviously, this one is in the third ventricle. We do have some hydrocephalus here because of obstruction of outflow. Um, these will break off and they will uh, quote-unquote metastasize. I don't like that term very much, but they will explant um, to other parts of the ventricle or to other ventricles or within the subarachnoid space. And this one is very invasive. So I would probably call this one a carcinoma based on its appearance. Um, the typical choroid plexus papillomas um, tend not to be infiltrative and they tend not to explant as well as these carcinomas. Oh, what an absolutely beautiful picture uh, from Paul Stromberg. And this is hemangiosarcoma. One of the problems here is sort of the differential uh, fixation of this tissue. So if you look at the outside, this could be a melanoma just as well. Uh, if you look in the uh, less fixed area, you can see that there's blood here. And hemangiosarcoma is the proper diagnosis. But you know, this, they can be a little tough. And I've been fooled over the years by looking at uh, mangiosarcomas, and they're so dark, I, you know, I tend to think melanoma. Both of them can uh, uh, metastasize to the brain, but only hemangiosarcoma is a primary uh, tumor of the brain. Remember, hemangiosarcomas arise from endothelial cells, so they can pop up in any organ that they want. This is a difficult, I found these cases very difficult over the years to, uh, to diagnose. And this is one of the best that uh, I can show you. And there are a couple possibilities here. Um, but if you look at the necrosis of the white matter, there are a number of inflammatory disease, um, including uh, canine necrotizing meningoencephalitis, which affects small breed dogs like pugs and chihuahuas, and Maltesers. And there is a necrotizing leukoencephalitis of Yorkshire Terriers, which resembles this very well because of 
what appears to be the confinement of the necrosis to the white matter. And then there's another condition which has undergone many name changes over the years, now goes by the name granulomatous meningoencephalitis, which may cause areas of necrosis as characterized histologically by the marked accumulation of normal inflammatory cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes, uh, predominantly CD3 positive lymphocytes in perivascular areas of the brain, and you may have resulting necrosis from that. Um, I think I do pretty well with the tumors. When it gets into the, uh, many of these uh, inflammatory slash autoimmune diseases, uh, it can be very difficult to sort out grossly. And I think this is a great picture for necrotizing leukencephalitis of primarily Yorkshire Terriers. But I always, when I see these sort of randomish areas of necrosis, one thing that I always put in my head are going to be one of these group of diseases. Here's one that I don't have any trouble with. It's a great one. And this is a neoplasm um, that's primarily seen within the spinal cord of the thoracolumbar, um, the most, most often seen between T10 and L2. And it's gone by a number of names, but currently it's being called the thoracolumbar tumor of young dogs. And it's been also called a spinal nephroblastoma, and it resembles um, a nephroblastoma. It is intradural. It compresses and invades the spinal cord and eventually replaces it. And at this point, the animal is showing significant uh, neurologic signs referable to this area. And if you look at it histologically, it looks just like a nephroblastoma. And it probably arises from uh, a, a rest of primordial cells that for some reason decides to make something that looks like a kidney. So that's why people used to call it the spinal nephroblastoma. And it has glomeruloid patterns, probably is positive for PAX-8, a nice tubular marker, and it's a, a great tumor that uh, lends itself to a pretty good gross diagnosis. Oh, here's one of my longtime favorite uh, uh, slides. I call this the dancing brachial plexus, um, but this is actually a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. They do tend to occur around the spinal nerves of the dog and the uh, and cattle, um, and you see them most commonly either at the brachial plexus or at the lumbar plexus. Now this is an older lecture, and because I uh, consider the eyes part of the nervous system, um, I have just a couple of quick eye things. We're not going to spend a lot of time with them. And I encourage you, if you are interested in ocular pathology, I do have a series of lectures on ocular pathology, which are available on the Foundation's uh, YouTube page or the uh, uh, JPC's video library. And it goes into depth on ocular pathology of the dog and of the uh, uh, of other domestic species. And it goes... Uh, um, breaks it down by uh, bacterial, viral, and all the different categories. So it's a much longer lecture, and I'm just going to throw a couple of uh, pictures I consider nice uh, at you right now for just a moment. And this is a condition, I sort of referred to it in the section on orthopedic pathology because it shares its name with an orthopedic lesion. This is a condition we don't see very much anymore as, as pathologists because it's fairly easily treated by a variety of immunosuppressive drugs. And this is a German Shepherd dog, could be a Belgian Malinois, but there is a vascular and pigmented membrane that uh, uh, is started growing at the, the uh, limbus of the lateral canthus and eventually will progress to, if untreated, will cover the surface of these animals' eye. And this is a condition which is known as panis. And because we see it more commonly in dogs at higher altitudes, it's thought that it might be um, the effect of ultraviolet light on the uh, 
uh, on the cornea and there's an alteration of corneal or other ocular antigens. And what you see first is an influx of inflammatory cells followed by vessels, pigment, and then ultimately corneal epithelial hyperplasia. But we just don't see it anymore because it's treated pretty well with immunosuppressive uh, eye drops, cyclosporine and, and related drugs. I like this one because this was my dog. And one of the problems that you see with German Shepherds and German Shepherd mixes is a condition which is known as lipid keratitis. Not a great name for this, but it's a lipid dystrophy that's seen in uh, German Shepherds. And you can also see it in animals that are hypothyroid. And it's lipid accumulation within the stroma of the cornea. And you can see this has been going on for a while. We have some neovascularization and it starts at the uh, limbus and works its way and progressively uh, encroaches on the remaining part of the cornea. Usually treated initially with a superficial keratectomy. We had did, did this uh, on, on uh, Tasha, this dog, and eventually it just grew back. But she died of, uh, she was overtaken by events. She got uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So uh, just a fun one. Uh, uh, this is a persistent pupillary membrane. When the eye is developing, there is this sort of uh, sheet of fibrovascular mesenchyme, which covers the pupil um, and the face of the lens in the anterior chamber. Um, and if it doesn't regress all the way that you get these sort of spider-like things, which um, will either attach to the back of the cornea, causing a mild corneal uh, uh, defect, or can attach to the face of the lens. Melanomas in the eyes of dogs uh, often arise in the anterior uvea, and they are less malignant. They tend to grow bigger, but they're less malignant than what we see in cats. Maybe about 15% over the lifetime of the animal will develop malignant. And they arise from the pigmented cells of the iris root and uh, they often are composed of um, very large cells with no mitotic activity. Um, what you want to do is you want to look at the smaller uh, spindle cells, which are the ones that are more proliferative, and get your uh, uh, get a nice bleach. And then most of your mitoses are going to be in the smaller spindle type cells, not generally considered as malignant as they are in the uh, cat, but they can result in a, uh, uh, a need for enucleation due to glaucoma. And uh, there are a bunch of other different uh, um, non-neoplastic accumulations of large amounts of pigment. We see it in Labrador retrievers um, and certain terriers, Norwich terriers will have melanosis of the globe. And then uh, one other very distinctive neoplasm of the eye, and then we'll call it a day on the nervous system, but this triangular neoplasm surrounding the optic nerve is the so-called retrobulbar meningioma. It is extracranial um, most of the time, and it uh, is a very characteristic presentation, comprises about 3% of, of all of the meningiomas that you can see, and uh, probably arises from the uh, cap cells, uh, which surround the optic nerve. So great classic, um, tends to be widest at the part that abuts the eye and uh, grows in a conical fashion along the optic nerve. Sometimes the leaves will start growing down the other optic nerve. So orbital or retrobulbar meningioma in the dog. Great picture here by Cindy Bell. So once again, if I know that uh, that doesn't even do justice to, uh, uh, to ocular pathology. So I'm going to refer you to that other series on ocular pathology, or at least gross pathology of the eye in all the domestic species. Okay, well, this concludes this particular lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I didn't go into a lot of depth, and hopefully we just gave you some interesting information, some fun facts on diseases of the nervous system of the dog. When we come back in lecture number nine, we're going to talk about reproductive pathology of the dog. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me for another 50 minutes. 
hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you come back to the Foundation's YouTube channel or the JPC's video library for more of these lectures on pathology of the dog or perhaps some other species. As always, I wish you good health and a wonderful day.